Before we start, everybody needs to have a um, number book number two. If you not don't have it, uh, uh, Dana, do you have book number two? Can you hold it up so everybody need to know what I'm talking about? It's the blue book, I think. Everybody got the blue book? Yeah. All right. Anybody not have the blue book that we'll be using in worship this morning? Thank you for that. We'd like to welcome everyone to our worship period this morning. If you're visitors of ours, we're so proud that you're here. We invite you to be a part of our worship anytime that you can be with us. We do usually ask a couple of things of you. If you would, take a yellow card on the back of the pew in front of you and fill it out and pass it to the center. Uh, or just go ahead and put it in the box in the back as you leave this morning. That would be even better. And members, remember to welcome our visitors t today um, as you have opportunity. Please um, uh, silence all your cell phones and things as we begin our worship. Um, and I will have a couple of other announcements uh, later on after our worship period. Our first song this no morning is number 406, number 406. If you want to be turning there in your book or it shall be, it'll be up behind us hopefully. As we begin our worship this morning, let's go to our Father in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the good health that you've given us to be here this morning, Father. And Father, we just ask that you would help us this morning to have our minds directed on you and your word. Father, we are so grateful for your word that you left it for us so that we will know how to live our lives, how to conduct ourselves in worship, Father, and how to be saved, Father. We ask that we will train our minds every day to ponder on your word, Father, to learn your word ourselves, Father, but beyond that, to help others to understand your word, Father. Father, again, help us during this hour as we sing praises to your name, as we listen to your word, to focus on you and your son. We are thankful for your son that gave his life for us, that shed his blood that we can have, so that we can have forgiveness of sin and be a child of yours. Father, we do know that there are times that we err from where you, what you would have us do, and we ask forgiveness for that. Love us and take care of us, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, worship the
Acts 2, 47. Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily, judges should be saved. Let's pray. Holy Father, hallowed is thy name. With reverence, Father, we praise thee as the Creator. And we give thanks for all the blessings we enjoy in this life, especially as citizens of this country. We pray, Father, that your blessings would be on this country so that the leaders would continue to provide us, especially the freedom to worship freely. Open our eyes, O oh Lord, to the majesty and the minutia of creation. That we may see that there is a God. And that we recognize our power. Within that majesty and madness of the creation of the universe, Father, we give thanks that you created mankind and it has such an emphatic place in creation that each soul created in thy image has a plan for salvation. Thank you, Father, for that plan that you set Jesus Christ to save us. Bless, Father, the church at this place. In the church worldwide, bless our leaders, our ministers, our deacons, our workers, every congregation, that we would receive the joys of living and walking the Christian life. Thank you for the opportunities to serve. May we all take advantage of them. Heal, Father, our sick. Give them a full measure of health. And when not possible, Father, restore them to the ability to continue to worship. Bless those who care for them. Bless those who see after them. Give them the facilities to tend to them and repair them. Keep them always and let them always know that they are loved. Bless, Father, the bereaved. Ease their heartaches. Give them the strength and will to carry on. Accept our worship, Father, this day. May we do all things in accordance with thy wills and thy teachings. Give us the strength to walk daily in the teachings of Jesus and to know the joys of Christian religion. And when we fail, dear Father, please forgive us as we know thy will and thy grace can. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Number 303. We'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4. I will hold prepared for the saints of my
It helps when I turn the mic on. All right. We are glad to have everyone here this morning. We're glad to see you all here. I'm going to set for myself my timer because we're going to have to move very quickly this morning through, through this lesson. And so we have a lot of scriptures to cover, and we want to be sure that we do so in a, time, in a timely fashion. We're going to do this a little different this week. In the past two weeks, uh, Mr. Gary has taught uh, from the floor, uh, and we've gone through this book page by page. We're going to do this a little different. Uh, what we're trying to accomplish in these uh, series of lessons is we're trying to help all of us see how we can teach the Word of God to our friends and family, every single one of us. If you are a, a Christian, even if you're a young Christian, uh, you can show other people what you know, why you know it, how you can prove uh, what the Bible says, and show it to friends and family. That's what we're trying to do. And so in the first two lessons of this series, we've been talking about you know, the inspiration of the Bible, the, where the Word of God comes from, uh, and what God uh, is telling us, who he spoke uh, to and through, that how, how he spoke you know, all, all through you know, the, uh, the Old Testament to, to, to the New, how he spoke through the prophets, how he spoke through Jesus, how he spoke through the Holy Spirit, how he spoke through the apostles, how he speaks through his word even today uh, and through us as his people. And so we looked and we listened to that over the first two lessons and we learned about what God is saying, that God is speaking to us you know, how we are to live, what we are to do to be saved. And so today, we're going to, once again, we're going to look, as a little title of the little booklet you have, back to the Bible to see what God says about his church. Because when we're talking about uh, the Word of God, we're, we're going to talk about his church. And then in later lessons, we're going to talk about salvation. And those are two really uh, big and important things for us to consider uh, in our lives. And so as we begin today, and as we begin talking about the church, uh, we want to explain this a little bit. This is, this, in this section here, what we're going to try to be accomplishing is to know that the fact there is the church, which has several things that, that kind of alludes to the fact that it's the church, not a church. We're going to see the fact that there is one church, we're also going to see who this church uh, belongs to, how was it purchased, uh, and, uh, and who is in it, and how to gain entrance into it. So we're going to see a little bit of that in this first section here, talking about the church. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16, and really we're going to read, uh, we have on the slide verse 18, we're going to read 15 through 18, and he said to them, but who do you say that I the Son of Man am? Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ the son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Who's, whose church is it? It's Jesus. It's Jesus' church. It belongs to him. It's his. He said he was going to build his church. He told Peter here in this instant, who Peter has just confessed Christ. He showed, he showed that he believed and had faith in Christ. He said that Jesus was going to build his church. Now, it, it's interesting since it's his church, you know, that makes him, Jesus, in charge, right? He's the head. He's over it. We see that taught in Ephesians chapter 1. In verses 20 through 23, where it reads, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So what do we see here in this text? Here is Jesus, and he has been put over all. He has been put 
over all. And in this verse, he is over all. He is over the church. And we notice something else about the church here in this verse. It not only calls it the church, it also calls it his body. Two different names we see here used, talking about the same group of people. It is the church. There is one church. It it belongs to Christ. It is his. He's over it. He's in charge. He's the head, the church, and it's the body. Let's remember that as we go through our lesson today to help us really kind of come to grasp with this oneness of God. I want us to turn over to, to Ephesians chapter 4. And in Ephesians chapter 4, what you're going to see is you're going to see a series of ones that relate to God in himself, that also relate to God's people and, of course, the church. And that reference can be found in Ephesians chapter 4 and in verse 4, where in talking about the body in which the Christ is the head of, that Christ is in charge of, it says there is one body and one spirit just as you are called in one hope of your calling. I hope we're starting to see a little bit about the church today, about the, the church of Jesus Christ. It's his. He bought and paid for it with his blood. He's the head over it. It is both the church. It is both the body. It is singular in nature. There are not many churches. Now, there are many congregations of the church, but there is but one church. And we need to think about that in regard to our spiritual life. Am I part of the church that Jesus talks about in his word? As we go through our Bible studies and as we're studying with people, that is a question that we need to answer and so does everyone else. Am I a part of the church that Jesus talks about in Scripture, am I in the church? Turn with me over to John chapter 17. John chapter 17, and we're going to read in verses 20 and 21, because this is something that happens to those that are in the church, and we need to see that. In John chapter 17, verses 20 to 21, it says, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. Here's another special distinction that we need to see about the church and about its members, is that we are made one. It's not just the fact that the church is one, that God is one, that his teachings are one, But within his body, within his church, we are one. We're united. We are united in Christ. And that unity in us and that unity in the faith is a special distinction that we need to to love and to cherish and to, to hold precious. That we have been united with fellow believers and loves that love God and love to serve his will. That is a special family that we have become part of. But not just become part of, we didn't join. It's not a social club. We didn't pay any you know, you know, monetary dues to, to become a member. That's not what the church is. The church, as we saw in our scripture reading this morning, is a body of people, body of saved people, that the Lord adds to. We see here in Acts chapter 2, in verse 47, reading this verse again, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. How do we gain entrance into the church? The Lord adds the saved to the church. The church is a very special body, and we need to see that. And, the, and what we need to do with that, if we're part of the church, and with, even within the church, we need to recognize something. There are to be no divisions. There are to be no divisions in the Lord's church. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10, it says, Now I plead with you, brethren. He's talking to people that are already in the church. He says, I plead with you, brethren, 
by the name of our Lord Jesus, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. There is a uniqueness. There is a oneness about God himself, about his message, about salvation, and about his church. And we need to see that in regard to the church. And as we start to leave this section talking about the church, one last verse. In Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have preeminence. Here we have our God. Our God in Jesus Christ who came this earth, that died on the cross, that bought the church with his blood. He paid for it. It's his. He's been placed by God as the head. And we, we are to look to him for the answers about the church, about gaining entrance into his church, and about how to live as his church. Now, let's talk a little bit about this morning about the organization of the church. We already talked about that it's his, so it belongs to him, and that, you know, that there's, it's one, and how we get interest in it, into that church is through him. But what is a little bit of the structure of this church? Now, we want to quickly turn to Matthew chapter 15 and verse 13. In Matthew chapter 15 and verse 13, this is, this is going to give us kind of an example uh, that we can uh, kind of see so that we will just kind of understand what we're trying to do here. You see, we talked about the oneness of the church and the uniqueness and the special nature of the church and how it's his and it belongs to him, which means that it's his to do and to set up as he sees fit and as he has put uh, in order. And so we see in Matthew chapter 15 and verse 13, he says, but he answered and said, every plant which my heavenly father has not planted will be uprooted. Now we need to keep that verse in our minds as we talk about the organization of the church because there are people in our wor world that teach that the organization of the church can be different than this can be different than what the Word of God says. And so what we're trying to do is to show that there is a pattern, that God had a structure, an organization to his people that is God-ordained, that is God-given, and we are to follow that organization. And so we see at the organization, the head, obviously, we've already said, is Jesus Christ. But who are some of the leaders in the church uh, that we know uh, in the Bible, know and see in the Bible. Turn with me to Acts chapter 14 and verse 23. In Acts chapter, four, verse, chapter 14 and verse 23, it says, So when they had appointed elders in every church and prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they have believed. So we see here is a group of people that we call in Acts chapter 14, verse 23, elders. This is, it's a group of people that are, are going to be leaders in the church, and, but we haven't quite seen yet, uh, as far as in our reading so far this morning, some of those specifics about these elders. So who are these elders? Well, once again, Acts chapter 20, in verse 17, it says, From uh, uh, Miletus, uh, he sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. So he, here he is, he's, he, he's making his way through. He's calling for these leaders to come to him, calling for these elders to come. You go on down to verse 28, it says, Therefore, Take heed to yourself and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. So here we've seen a few more words because in the first verse, in verse 17, we call them elders. We come down and we see those elders are, are answering, have a relationship with a flock, which when you think about flock, you think, immediately think about a shepherd. Uh, think about someone that is leading sheep. And then you come down and it says they've been made overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he has purchased with his blood, with his own blood. So what do we see here? Right here at the, out of the gate, when we talk about the organization of the church, you see elders, 
you see shepherds, you see overseers, and what we're going to see uh, here in a moment, you're going to see a, a, another word in bishop. In our day and time, we like to use the word, uh, this use in our area especially, is the word pastor. People call the church office all the time and ask to speak to the pastor. Here's the, here's the thing. At Sowell Road, we have seven uh, pastors at this time. Elders, shepherds, overseers, bishops. Those are all biblical terms you're going to see. Uh, that they're going to see, and I'm not one of them. I'm not qualified to be one of them. Brother Gary, who preaches here on a regular basis, he also is not one of these shepherds. He is not one of the overseers that is here at this body. He is a minister, just like I am. And we think about that in regard, we are to use Bible names and Bible uh, qualifications to represent those names and to represent those, the organization that Christ, that God has set up and established. We are to do things as God has told us to do. So here, these men, they had a special role. They're to shepherd, they're to oversee, they're to lead the flock uh, in, in all of uh, these spiritual ways that we talk about here. So we'll go to Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1 and verses 5 through 7, we're going to see a little bit about some of these qualifications of these specific men that are chosen to lead. And he's telling the young man Titus, notice this, two different passages we're going to read this morning, talking to young men, giving them instructions on what the leaders are to be and to look like and how they're to act and live. So here is the first one that's given to Titus. For this reason, I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking. Notice, he's telling them how the structure is to be. Set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. If a man is blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of uh, dispensation or insubordination, for a bishop, I told you we would get to that term in a moment, for a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but hospitable, a lover of what is good, sober-minded, just, holy, self-controlled, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who contradict. This is a very special job, responsibility, opportunity that these men that we call shepherds, that we call elders here at Sowell Road, that they have, but not just here at Sowell Road, that are to be in every congregation of the Lord's church because this is the organization in which that God has commanded. There are to be elders. We continue that reading in 1 Timothy uh, chapter 3 and verse 8, I'm sorry, in verses 1 through 7, and we see once again the qualifications of this bishop, elder, shepherd, overseer. And it says, this is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless. The husband and one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable and able to teach not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Now we could spend days, weeks, months talking about every single one of these qualifications, but it's a very lengthy list that you see in, in, in length in two different uh, major sections. And what does it tell us? It tells us that God has qualifications that are required for the leaders that he has called shepherds, that he has called overseers, that are to lead the flock, the church, the body of Jesus Christ. This is God's organization. Now, it's not just elders as a position in the organization of the church. 
you also have a position that we call deacons. Continuing on in 1 Timothy chapter 3, going down to verse 8 through 12, it says, likewise, he's continuing this conversation, likewise, deacons must be reverent, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy for money, holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. But let these also first be tested, then let them serve as deacons, being found blameless. Likewise, their wives must be reverent, not slanderers, temperate, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husband of one wife, ruling their children in their own house as well. For those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Notice in this, both in elders and in deacons. These are men, because they all have to be husbands. These have children. They all have to be fathers and keep their children in submission. They are to be faithful. It even lists in here qualifications that their wives are even to have and act like. This is the organizational structure of the church and how God intended his church to be led. And so we stop for a moment and we look around. Is the church that I'm a part of structured in this way? As Christ as the head, as shepherds, as overseers are leading the flock, as deacons that are helping serve, as, as we read in other passages, as ministers that help minister into the congregation, which the elders and shepherds and, and deacons can be ministers as well. But just notice the structure pattern that God has set up for his church. And so we come to Philippians chapter 1 and verse 1. And continuing on, not only to Timothy and Titus did he give these instructions to, but here to the church that was at Philippi, Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are, at, or who are in Philippi with the bishops and deacons. He's writing to the whole church, but he's writing to them, and he's especially paying, calling attention to those bishops, to those deacons, to those leaders in the church that Jesus established. These are just, these are the qualifications, and these are the organization that we see within the church that Jesus talks about in the Bible. Now, we're going to skip a section in your little books that you had this morning um, that talks about worship. And we're going to go to the, the last section in that book uh, talking about the name of the church. Uh, and this really continues in our outline. We're going to get back to the book here in a moment uh, and really go through and answer some questions. But we're skipping to a section talking about the name of the church. Right now, uh, in our parking lot, there is a sign on the front. It says, Sywell Road Church of Christ. Does that sign make us biblically accurate? No. Does that sign mean that we are the church that Jesus established? No. How do I know that? Because anybody can buy that sign. They can call it one of the sign places. They can have a design. They can put one in the front of their house if they wanted to and put a sign in the front yard that says, something in regards of church, church of Christ, they can put it out there that doesn't necessarily mean that that sign is an accurate representation. But in Scripture, we do see some very important passages that we must consider in talking about the name of the church. Let's first go back to a passage we already read this morning in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Whose church is it? It's Jesus. We've already established that this morning. So let's take into consideration Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. Therefore take heed to yourself and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. So we see it's been purchased by the blood of Jesus, it's the church that belongs to God, belongs to God uh, and that it's, it's his. It's his church. And so we talk, start talking about names of what name should we associate with the church that Jesus established. Well, obviously, it has to show that it belongs to him. 
It is, it is, as it refers to it here, the church of God, the church of Jesus, the church of Jesus Christ. Uh, these names are biblically sound in their structure. Now, what makes a name, even a sign, accurate is not just there being a sign and what's on the sign, but also the practices taking place inside the people. Do the people reflect the name? Do they support the name? Are they honoring the name? Are they living in such a way that gives, uh, you know, that gives support to what they are doing and why are they are doing it? If we are living in such a way that is not repre a representation of what Christ has called us to do, then we are not living as the church. And we can put signs and we can send out brochures, but we must live as the church to be the faithful group of the church. And so here, we think about this. There are people in our world that name all types of religious groups after all types of things. They name after people, they name after you know, things we must do. But what did God say about his people? We've already discussed this this morning. His people are not divided. So in 1 Corinthians chapter, 10, chapter 1 and verses 10 through 13, he says, Now I'll plead with you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Now I say to you that each of you says, I am of Paul or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Now we use this verse to help prove a very good point. We are not going to have a church with an appropriate name my name is Derek. Say, the church of Derek. What good is that? Is Christ divided? No. So the church of Christ, the church that belongs to Christ, the church of Jesus, the church of God, needs to have a, a name that represents him because he is the one that's in charge. Because it belongs to him. It's not of Derek, it's not of any other preacher, minister, of any kind, of any era, it is of Christ because it belongs to him. That is what Church of Christ means out on our sign out there. It's the church that belongs to Christ. And we as people need to realize that. We need to not let people say that the church is a denomination, is a man-made organization of, of people. No, it is a God-proven, a God-ordained, a God-called group of people that are saved, that are following him in the ways in which he has instructed us. Christ is not divided. We think about this in the way we live and the way we act in verse, Colossians chapter 3 and verse 17. And whatever you do in, the, in word or deeds, you all in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to God the Father through him. We are to do everything in his name. By his authority, we are to do everything. In a reference to the churches there in the first century, we see in Romans chapter 16, in verse 16, it says, greet one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ greet you. The churches of Christ, really meaning the churches of that belong to Christ, that are his. That is what we are to be. That is the church of the Bible, the church that belongs to him, the church that follows his will, the church that does what he says for us to do. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 8, in, verses, uh, in verse 5. And it says, Who serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed, when he set, or when he was about to make the tabernacle, for he said, "See that you all you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain." We use that verse, and if you read, want to read the whole context, you can read there in verses one through five. But you see here within this that God has a pattern. 
He had a pattern in the Old Testament. He has a pattern in the New. He has a pattern for his church. He has a pattern for the organization. He has a pattern and a way of thinking for the name of his church because the church belongs to Christ. And so this morning, as we think about this, go ahead and open up uh, your book, your little booklets we handed out to you. I want you to think about the church in relationship to these passages that we covered this morning. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, in, in, in regard to this passage, who built the church? Jesus. To whom does the church belong? Jesus. Did Jesus build the church, or build churches, plural, or the church, singular? He built the church. It's singular. What about Ephesians chapter 1 and verses 20 through 23? Is Jesus the head? We're on page two of your little booklet. Is Jesus the head over all things to the church? Yes, absolutely. In verse 23, the church is also called his what? It's called his body. We can see on the next slide, there are images here uh, of what the body cannot be. We don't have two heads. We don't have two bodies. That is not the way that God set up his church. What about Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 4? Is there, o- is there only one hope? Yes. Is there only one Holy Spirit? Yes. Is there only one body, the church? Yes. John chapter 17, verses 20 to 21. Did Jesus pray that his followers all be one? Yes. What about 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10? Is religious division condemned? Yes. Since religious division is condemned, and since Jesus prayed that all his followers be one, must we strive to be one religiously? Yes. What about Colossians 1 and verse 18? Since Jesus is the head of the church, the body, should we go to anyone other than Jesus and the inspired writers of the New Testament to learn the organization, worship, and name of his church? No. No. We don't turn to anybody but to Christ. In regard to the organization of his church, uh, if a church is not built in accordance with the word of God, will it be rooted up? Yes. There is only one church, and that's the church that Jesus established. Acts chapter 14 and verse 23, did these inspired men uh, ordain elders in every church? Yes. Are we right if we do uh, as they did in, in ordaining a plurality, multiple elders in every congregation? Absolutely, yes. Could we be wrong if we did not organize the church the way those inspired men of God did? Yes, absolutely. We would be wrong. What about Acts chapter 20 and verse 17 uh, and verse 28? Are the elders to be overseers of the church? Yes, they're to look after the flock. What about Titus chapter 1 verses 5 through 7? When Paul told Titus to set things in order, did he tell him to ordain elders? Yes. When, he, when we do that, what Titus did in organizing the church, are we doing the will of God? Are we doing what God wants us to do when we do things his ways? Yes, absolutely. Do the terms elders, bishops, and overseers refer to the same office, the organization? Yes, absolutely. What about 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 to 7? Must an elder be married? Yes. Must an elder have children? Yes. May a recent convert or a a novice, someone that's new to the word, serve as an elder? No, they cannot. This is a very special job given to leaders within the church. 1 Timothy 3, verses 8 through 12. What church official is under discussion here? Well, this is talking about deacons in this passage. Is it God's plan that there be qualified elders and deacons in every church or every congregation of the Lord's church? Yes, there should be, both deacons and elders. Philippians chapter 1, in verse 1, this is on page 4, the church at Philippi was organized with both bishops and deacons, and that's exactly the way the church of the Bible is to be organized. Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, talking about the name of the church. We've already discussed this numerous times this morning. Who built the church? Jesus. Um, Jesus said he was going to build whose church? He said his church, my church, 
It's the church of Jesus. What about Acts 20 and verse 28? Who purchased the church? Jesus. Whose name should be on the deed of the church? Who, who, who's it belong to? It belongs to Jesus. What about 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verses 10 through 13? Is it a sin to name the church after, after Paul? Paul was a great preacher. What about Apollos? Another great preacher. Cephas or any other human being? Yes. Christ is not divided. If the church were named after Paul, uh, whom would be, who would we be glorifying? Would we be glorifying Paul? Paul was a great preacher, but he was not the Christ. Jesus is the Christ. If the church were named after a religious act such as repentance, uh, what would we be glorifying? Would we be glorifying just repentance? Not glorifying Christ and the salvation we have through him. If it were a sin to, uh, to name it the Pauline church, would it be a sin to name it any other grouping, uh, a grouping of people? Uh, after a man by the name of Martin Luther, uh, yes. What about, if it was a sin uh, to call it repentant church, what about uh, the sin to, uh, to, uh, to call it the Bapt Baptist church or anything, any other kind of name of this sort? God wants us to be named after him and, and calling, giving him the proper structure and proper head of the church. Can you think of any other religious names that might not be appropriate or they're just wrong according to Scripture? Colossians chapter 3, verse 17. Are we to do all in the name of the Lord Jesus? Yes, absolutely. What would this include by the name in which we refer to God? Would this include what we're to call uh, Christ's church? Yes. This would include the name in which we are to call. Romans chapter 16. Verse 16, do you read of the church of Christ in the Bible? Yes. Would it be wrong to call the church by this name? Absolutely not. Would this name glorify the one who built the church and bought it with his blood? Yes. This name does glorify God. Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 5, was Moses warned to build the tabernacle after God's pattern? He was, yes. Must we be careful how we build, how we organize how we are set up as the church? Yes. And so we think this morning, we think about the church and what God has done for us. God has set up an, in a very structured pattern of what his church is to be. First and foremost, it's his. He bought it with his blood. He paid for it on that cross and he rose on, on, on that third day giving us an opportunity to gain interest into that church through his blood. And those that are being saved are added to his body, to the church. He organized that church in a very specific way, with very specific leaders, with very specific qualifications. We are to be and live as the church that Jesus established. Today, are you living as part of that church? Have you had your sins washed away? Are you saved? Have you been added by Christ, as we read earlier? Have you been added by Christ into his body? If today there's anything that we can do, whether it's prayers to the church, today you want to put on Christ in his body and have the Lord add you to him. If there's anything we can do for you, please come as we stand and as we sing.
few responses this morning, and we want to pray for each of them. Uh, first of all, Ray Bell uh, gave us a note. He says, I've sinned against my wife, my son, by not being a good example of a Christian, and most recently against my mother-in-law by uh, being very angry. Uh, please pray for, we want to pray for them, uh, that he'll be better, a better father. And, and husband. Uh, A.J. Bracey also came uh, asking for prayers to be strong, to keep the faith and stay on the path, uh, and wanted to repent of his sins. And We know as we get to be his age, it becomes very, very difficult getting outside your home uh, and around others, developing friendships, and we just have to be very careful, right, about who we're around and, and, and try to stay around Christian brethren that can help you. We appreciate his heart. Also, Boyd Chase came saying much of the same thing. He says, I need prayers for strength to be a better example, even though I'm not uh, in life a bad person. I know that God doesn't like a lukewarm Christian, and I constantly feel like I'm a failure. Uh, he needs help from God and our prayers to, for strength uh, and to be a better example. So we want to pray for all three of those, appreciate the heart, of all three of those that have come forward. So let's take this opportunity to do that. If you'd bow with me. Father, we're thankful for opportunities like this, Father. We're thankful for what we heard through your word this morning, Father, that we are one body and that we're a family, Father. And Father, thinking about being a family, Father, we want to encourage one another and help one another. And so, Father, we ask that you would be with all three of these guys. Father, be with Ray Bell. Help him to be a better husband and, and father. Uh, help him to be able to control his anger, Father. Help us to do whatever we can to be of help to him. Father, we ask that you be with A.J. Uh, as he is now becoming his own man, Father, and Sometimes the growing pains, Father, just uh, hurt us in that we develop friendships, we develop and, and do things that we shouldn't be doing, Father. So we just ask that you would be with A.J. and help him to, to lean on us, Father, and help us to be a strength to him, to be what he needs to be in your church, Father. And the same for Boyd, Father. We know that, uh, again, as we get out from underneath our parents and, and that we often develop friendships, that we often get away from what you would have us to do, Father. And we pray that you would help him again to be more faithful, to lean on us and to depend on his Christian friends and his Christian family. Help us to be there for each of these guys, Father, to, to be able to build them up and to encourage them in the path of being Christian. Father, we do ask this for all of us. We know that the Christian life is very difficult times. The world's leaning on us to be one way, and your word tells us another way. And so, Father, help us to, to depend on your word and to recognize that you are the one that did purchase the church, that you are the one that wants us to live according to your ways, Father. And that it is that that is good for us. Help us to recognize that. Father, again, we're thankful for these three men. And, and again, help us to, to love them and care for them. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Number 146, 146. Sing this song to uh, help prepare our minds for the partaking of the Lord's Supper. <clears throat> Marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace I take.
read from John 19, as we prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper, starting in verse 28. John 19, starting verse 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on hyssop, and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up the spirit. Please pray with me as we give thanks for the bread. Dear Heavenly Father, Thank you for this day and all the many blessings of it. Most importantly, thank you for sending your son to, to die on the cross that we may have hope of a home in heaven with you one day. Dear Lord, as we prepare our minds to partake of this bread that represents your son's body that hung on that cross, help for us to do so in a manner well pleasing your sight. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Please pray with me again as we give thanks for the fruit of the vine. To God, again, we come to you, wanted to thank you for the sacrifice that your son made for each and every one of us. Dear Lord, as we think back to the, to the pain and suffering that he, he endured on that cross, while we take this fruit of the vine that represents your blood, his blood that was shed, dear God, just help for us to do so in a manner well-pleasing your sight. In Christ's name we pray, amen. That concludes the Lord's Supper. I uh, have a few more announcements to, to make. Uh, one is, let's don't forget those, these three guys that have come forward this morning to continue to keep them in our prayers. Also, it's always good news to hear one that's been added to the church. And Terrell Wilder, who is the grandson of Brenda Berry, was baptized Wednesday night by Logan. Uh, Terrell, if you'd just raise your hand, or there he is, right over there. The last one of the guys, so make sure you give him a good hug. Uh, it was a blessing to baptize him on Wednesday night. That is Logan. So we appreciate those who studied with him. It wasn't just Logan, I understand, that did some studying with him. So we appreciate all those that took part in that. I always ask that we as members uh, keep a look on all those who are sick. Uh, do appreciate Harold being with us this morning, even though he did have surgery and continues to be swollen a little bit. We appreciate seeing him and Bonnie with us uh, this morning. Uh, also remember that Hewlin is at home. Let's continue to pray for Hewlin and Annette as she continues to take care of him. Also add to your uh, announcement, Pat Nettles, who is the mother of Dean, is not doing well and is sick, so keep her in, in your prayers. And all the, all the others that are listed here, uh, keep them in your prayers. Also, there's a number of Bible studies that are going on right now, so let's keep... Um, those in our prayers, that they will, will be successful. This is from Shonda that was given to me before services. She says, we are now accepting gently worn clothes and apparel to be placed in the downstairs fellowship hall. Uh, please follow the guidelines posted on how to organize your clothes before leaving them. And I think that last line may be the most important thing. There are guidelines down there. We just don't want clothes being brought in and thrown down. So... If you would, just as you uh, uh, may want to turn in clothes or are going to, make sure you read the guidelines and follow those. Also, if you would like to donate or cook a dish for the Ronald McDonald House for the month of August, please see Shonda. 
Let's remember that early risers are Tuesday, Tuesday morning uh, at 7 o'clock. I have a note here that, that I would like to read. It says, to our Sawwell family, thank you so much for the many cards and meals you have provided uh, for the past months. Thank you especially for lifting up my name in the, uh, to the Father for healing. Many other kind deeds were done that ease our load. We're uh, so blessed to be a part of the Sawwell Road Church. With appreciation, Gary and Teresa Hampton. So continue to keep her in her prayers. Keep Gary in your prayers. He is in North Carolina um, doing a gospel meeting. Uh, and also, uh, Logan had to go at a wedding. I think it's his sister's wedding this weekend. So they are all traveling. So let's keep them in our, in our prayers. If you would stand and we'll have the closing song and the prayer, final prayer. I'm not ashamed to call my Lord, or to be in His cross. Great may the honors of His word, the glory of His cross. And as His cross, His promise stands, and He did